Okay, no, cooperative mode isn't available online. Uh, so yeah, so we've done a lot of work with gameplay and how the game plays and how you control it. So one of the things we've done is the response dribbling, so the close control dribbling, that's been completely overhauled. Um, there's all new animations in there, so what you will find is it's a lot more responsive. Um, it will stick to your foot more, you can do a lot more with it. So for for users who utilise that feature, they'll, they'll notice big, big difference and improvements is in that. So there will be an offering, um, I can't speak to that, and um, more of that will be announced officially uh, soon. Uh, but rest assured there will be something, but I can't talk to exactly the specifics of that right now. So in terms of gameplay, the big difference between uh, World Cup and FIFA 14 is, well there's a number, I mean we've kind of tuned a lot of areas. Um, a lot of that has been driven by consumer feedback, so we listen to our consumers, we listen to what they like and don't like about FIFA 14. So a lot of the features we've actually put in has been driven directly by them. So some of the examples um, from FIFA 14 that people had an issue with is they felt it was a little bit laggy in terms of response time. So we have introduced features to combat that, so features like explosive player movement. So the idea is that it reacts much quicker, much more responsive to your movement, so the players will accelerate faster, decelerate faster, turn faster. We've also um, lessened the uh, trapping error, so that was another feedback from FIFA 13. Often there was some frustration with the trapping area that was kind of out of your control, it would touch your feet and bounce off, so we've tuned that accordingly. We've also got pinpoint passing, which is the ability to get the ball to your teammates a lot quicker. So we've changed a lot um, based on feedback from FIFA 14 and I think what the, those users will notice is a, a, a big difference, uh, probably the biggest difference we've ever done in an event title in terms of the gameplay and how it plays. Uh, and then on top of that there's a whole slew of new features specific to World Cup, so things like set piece, corner kicks, uh, the ability to call a set play at a corner kick, all new animations for the keeper during penalty kicks, new um, AI and new intelligence at, uh, at penalty kicks. Uh, plus uh, over a hundred new animations in game, so I think users will notice a lot of difference between the two products, and, uh, and and all the feedback so far has been very positive in the fact that it does play a very different and noticeably different game. Okay, so Story of Finals is the live link between our game and the real world, and the idea is that uh, after you've watched a game, shortly after you've watched that, a game, so maybe you watch Spain v Australia. Um, and Spain score 6-0 and Torres scores a hat-trick. About an hour after the game you will be able to go to our game and relive that moment um, through the story of qualifying. And we perhaps set to you as playing as uh, Fernando Torres with 10 minutes left to try and recreate history. So that will be um, really exciting in the sense that we really want to capture the excitement and passion that you've just witnessed in the real world and transvert that to our game. So we want to make our game the go-to place after you've watched the real world game. And in terms of what uh, the scenarios will be, that will be very much dictated by what happens in the real world. So we have control over the ability to start at any point in the game, so at any minute, uh, various situations, goal kick, free kick, kick off, penalty kick, um, all of these situations will, uh, will be replicated. So ultimately what those scenarios are will be very much driven by what we see in the real world. Okay, so yeah, so training mode is um, a really interesting addition to all our tournament modes. So it's available in Captain Your Country, Road to the World Cup, and the World Cup mode. And it really adds more power to the use than ever before. So previously, we would basically just give you Spain, for example, and you would have to play with Spain's predefined set of uh, attributes. What training allows you to do is really mold those players as you see fit by focusing training on certain key areas. So for example, if you think David Silva needs more pace, you can pick David Silva and focus him at pace training. So it puts a lot more control and power in the hands of the user. There is a risk reward system though. Um, it's not continually add, add, add. If you aren't very good at it or you fail, you can decline um, those attributes. So there is, like I say, a risk and reward element. And how you're able to grow that will depend on the, the, the player themselves. There's certain potentials for each player. So you can't max everyone player out at 99, for example. 
it will be dictated a lot by the players, uh, the potentials and, and what you can and can't do with those players. So whilst it's powerful, it's not all powerful. It, it doesn't take the game to unrealistic, uh, unrealistic levels. But it does allow a level of uh, influence and control that we've never given uh, users before. Um, so yeah, so training is not all powerful and you can't really uh, convert Afghanistan into Spain. You, you're limited in the sense that uh, for those guys particularly, you can only train four guys at once. So it's not like you can train the entire team. Training events are limited to uh, before each match. So you are limited in the number of those you have. It's not usually you can train, train indefinitely. Um, so for an example of Afghanistan, you could get them to a certain level. Uh, not even close to, to the levels of Spain because you would have to pick a certain individual and get him up and there just isn't sufficient time within the schedule to do that. So again, we didn't want to make it all powerful, we didn't want to be able to do uh, create unrealistic teams. It's more focusing on key players that maybe um, work in the way you you play. So maybe you're like a fast pacey striker, so maybe you can take one player and, and, and focus on him throughout the course to turn him into that into that player. But you just don't, won't have the time to kind of uh, completely turn around an entire team. Because again, authenticity is key for us, so we didn't want to take it to unrealistic levels. It's hard not to say Spain when I'm in Spain, but I think you'll, st yeah, if they were to win it, it would be unbelievable because then it would be Euro, World Cup, Euro, World Cup, which I think they would go down as the best team in history if they were to do that. I do think they'll struggle because history shows us that um, uh, European teams in South America don't normally do well. A European team has never won it that, that played in South America. So I think it's hard to go against Brazil. If they get the backing of the crowd and get off to a good start, I think they'll kind of be unstoppable. The one team I would say, depending on the way the draw works out, of course, that could potentially stop them and it may make a great final, would be Argentina. Because I think man for man, they're a better team with the likes of Messi and Aguero, etc. But, and, and they've got the added incentive of, you know, Brazil are their arch rivals, their arch nemesis. So were they to win it in Brazil's backyard, they would become legends forever in, in Argentina. So they've got their own motivation. So I think it's going to be between one of those two. Uh, if I had to pick one, it would be Brazil. Because if they, like I say, get the crowd behind it, we saw it in the Confederations Cup, uh, I think they will be unstoppable. Okay.